So hi, Jane. Welcome so much. I'm here with Jane Davis, who's very kindly agreed to be with us in Art Tribe today. And I'm really grateful. Thank you, Jane. How are you today? Good. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I'm really excited to see those stripes behind you, which I'm going to ask you about a little bit later because I've been following some of that on online. Um, mm -hmm. But first of all, for lots of people watching this will know exactly who you are because they'll have either been following you on YouTube or on Instagram or somewhere. But for those who don't know, um, where are you, first of all, in the world? I am in the United States in Vermont in a small town named Rupert. Rupert. <laughs> Rupert, oh, Vermont. Yeah. Like Rupert yeah. Bear. You know who Rupert Bear is? Rupert Bear is. I Rupert. do. Yeah. I do. And someone gave me a little teeny book of Rupert Bear some years ago. And then just last week, someone gave me an enormous book that of tons of Rupert Bear stories, <laughs> like a hundred years of Rupert Bear. I'm absolutely yeah. fascinated by these windows behind you. Is this a, a studio at your home or is this a rented studio? This is a relatively new studio um, and it's attached to my house. I had it built, I think the building started late 2017, took a couple of years. Um, I mean, not constant work. The builder was working on a few projects, but um, I think it was end of 20. 18 that I was able to start working in here while they were continuing on the exterior siding and stuff but it's just been a real dream of mine to have have a studio <laughs> that's um I don't know that's perfect and it's uh, brilliant it looks like it's got really high ceilings and well my husband is a building designer so he designed it and he's also the zoning administrator in our tiny town of oh, that's Rupert. <laughs> and so he was the one who said that I couldn't put a separate building on my property. Um, oh, he said you couldn't. Oh. Yeah, I thought it would be a separate building. Uh, that was my plan because before I had a separate building where my studio was upstairs in a barn, but it didn't have running water and um, it didn't have high ceilings and it was there were some inconveniences about it. Um, and I had I had wanted to build a studio and I, I just had this idea that it would be separate from the house, but God, there's so many advantages to having it attached to the house. Yeah. And he did a beautiful job of um, designing it so that it really looks from the exterior and the interior, it really looks like a separate space. Yeah. You know, it doesn't make the house look like it's huge. It's got different siding. It's got a little kind of transition area. Um, and then it has these high ceilings, plus it has this loft space that oh, will have storage that, that will have railings on it um but that's my office and yoga space and some storage up there so excellent wow that's amazing yeah so um how what i'd love to know first of all because i don't know this about you actually is how long have you been a professional artist have you always done that since leaving school Practically, I started as a potter in my late twenties. Um, after undergraduate school, I went I went back to school for ceramics, and I was a potter for fifteen years. And I tr there was some transition overlap between that and licensing artwork for manufacturers because what happened in ceramics was I wasn't that good of a potter, but I really liked the surface design, the surface decoration. Right. And I in that profession, I transitioned at one point in the late nineties to buying ready-made white bisqueware and painting on it. And that felt right. like totally cheating, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but I was so much you're better at it. You, you're doing the bits you loved and not the bits you didn't love. Right, and I just wasn't that good at making, you know, <laughs> dishes out of wet clay. Um, so, so then it became, well, why am I doing this? I should license these designs to manufacturers. And so I did that. And that was about 10 years. And I had some really good early success with that, but the, the landscape of that world changed quite a bit while I was in it. And I became not very good at it. And it was just, I liked the work, but I didn't like the anxiety of not knowing, you know, when or when I would have work. So at one point I just thought I have to get a job or I have to, you know, reinvent what I'm doing. And I had always done fine art 
on the side and um, shown my work periodically. And I had always done little workshops teaching, um, yeah. usually little craft projects or, you know, how to make a this or that kind of book or box or whatever. And so I knew I liked teaching. I just thought, mm, let me see if I can do this. And that was around 20, 2009 or 2010, so yeah, around there. Mm -hmm. And so did you begin teaching in person or did you begin online? Oh, I began in person. Yeah, online teaching was was pretty new. A ways away, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I so yeah, I must have started in 20, 2010 because I remember it was 2011 when I started my first online workshop. Right. And uh, you were quite early into online. Yeah. There weren't many people teaching then online. No, and I had to kind of cob it together. I mean, now if when people want to teach online and they ask me advice, I like go to one of the platforms. Yeah. Um, you know, there's Skillshare and Teachable and all kinds of platforms where they've got it all set up. But I remember I gave myself six months to learn how to make video, how to edit video, how to what platforms I wanted to use for interaction, how I was going to deliver lessons. Um, you know, it took quite a while. And and that that format is still one that I use. It's yeah, I use a blog for interaction. And one drawback of that is that there's a bit of a learning curve with learning to use a WordPress blog. And so some people balk at that, but yeah. It has so much more functionality than than the other kinds of forums I've seen, and I, I keep looking, I keep looking yeah. for ways to yeah. get an interaction that's going to be easier. Yeah. Um, and so far, you know, and it, the the blog is it's harder, but the functionality really makes it work. Yeah. So you were now teaching, and you'd moved into painting at around the same time. Is that right? Well, I had always done some painting and printmaking and um, drawing, and in my fine or in my excuse me in my um, freelance work doing design for manufacturers, I was painting. I mean, I was I was painting more illustrative kind of images um, and some just patterns and so forth. But I was using acrylic paint and using collage and using the same kinds of materials. So moving into fine art more full-time and focusing on it wasn't a real shift in materials. Yeah, yeah. It was a I different mindset. One of the things that attracts people to you and particularly your YouTube channel, other artists, I mean, um, and that attracted me when I first found you was this, you've got this really curious, approach to the way you work so you seem to follow your curiosity follow your interests follow and just follow them where they lead without um there's never a focus it seems to me in those videos on the end result on making a good painting it's the focus is on the process on the exploration on the fun and i would imagine that that because that's how we see you on youtube that that's how you are in your practice that that's the way you work it has, is. has it always been that way oh that's a good question um i think so i periodically go into a production mode where i think okay damn it i'm gonna make some paintings <laughs> and it falls flat yeah always. like <laughs> yeah. i am just as addicted to the outcome as anybody and i have to fight that but it's easy to fight it because I make crappy work when I focus on, okay, I'm, I'm going to make a painting or I'm going to make a series or here's how it's going to go. Like as if I have any clue, I don't. And I keep having to remind myself of that. And I do so by going there and then failing. And yeah. the only way that I can make work that excites me is by following my curiosity. And I got to say, I listened to your podcast, a recent one on limitations and um, putting limitations on your exploration and also then how we put sort of false limitations on ourselves. I thought that was a really interesting discussion um, because that is kind of 
how I advocate working. And that's certainly how I teach. Like, here's your tools, do this with them. And then when people go out of the box and say, well, I'm gonna use this other tool. Um, my response is, well, then you're not learning how to use this tool. Like, this is learning. Um, yeah. So I kind of do that with my own practice with a little more leeway, of course. Yeah, so that is kind of how I work. And then the curiosity sort of drives the, like I start with, with some limitations and then, um, or parameters, I call them. And, and I heard that that's you- That's a good you word, yeah, that's a good yeah. word. Um, it's a more neutral word. And then th inevitably that sort of series or group of work is gonna lead to some other questions. And then I follow that curiosity. So yeah. what I'm kind of grappling with right now, just um, in my head is, there seems to be a lot of value put on consistency and coherence. People want to do, here's what I hear from my students and from myself. I feel like I'm working all over the map. I work in all different styles. I work in all different media. I don't know what my style is. I don't know what my voice is. I don't know who I am as an artist. Yeah. Okay. That's me too. Like I'm always feeling that way. Okay, yeah, I've been doing stripes for a while, but God, they're all different. They're all over the place. I'm getting influences from all over the place. And, you know, I'm also doing some other work and I'm probably doing three things at once. And, <laughs> um, you know, and currently I'm looking for more representation because I'm, I'm teaching less, I'm painting more. And so I need more galleries to, to sell my work because yep. I don't, I don't like selling my own work. I don't want to be in that business. I'm, right. I want more representation. So I have a gallery here in Vermont and um, I sell some work online. So it's, so it's a matter of like the output is greater. And so I'm wondering here, like, okay, now do I have to worry about consistency? <laughs> like, it, it, it's so funny for people to hear you saying that when, cause they feel like, oh, when I get established, I'll have my voice. And it'll be the same then. And then I won't have this problem anymore. But I always feel like, I mean, I teach a course called Find Your Voice, mm -hmm. by which I mean finding your freedom to express yourself freely, your voice on a broader scale, really. I don't mean style. I mean, right. being able to speak up in paint for yourself and do your own thing. But um, I, what I've found is as soon as I find something that feels like it's consistently me, then I'm curious to move away and do something else. And then I'm a beginner again, because I, I don't know what I'm doing. At the moment, I've started working in a new way and I don't know what I'm doing. So yeah, I'm, I've seen that, it was lovely. <laughs> so it's like, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, some things I try to sort of failure. But I have that same feeling of, yeah, but will people think, oh God, you know, it was one thing, now it's another, now it's another. Mm -hmm. But I kind of think, uh, if I look at your work, I can see it's you still. Mm -hmm. I can see your work is you still. Yeah, so, so we, we're, not as, we're not as weird as we think we are, maybe. Well, I have a couple of theories about that. One is that as the artist, we will see our work, we will see all the differences, where someone on the outside will see the consistency. Yes. The other is, I think that that narrow deep exploration versus the broader maybe not quite so deep exploration there's a, like a continuum um, between you know someone working in a very narrow um, set of parameters and and sticking with that for years and years I mean think of Karine Leger I love her work and as long as I've been looking at her she her work has evolved really slowly um but man she is good at it yeah. <laughs> and you know her painting doesn't suffer from kind of just banging out paintings going into production mode I think her paintings are fresh and I think it's because she's found her curiosity in in a sort of narrow mode but she goes very deep into it Right. Some people, you know, kind of bang out the same painting over and over again. And, and you can tell the work kind of falls flat. It, it yeah, shows. that's different, isn't it? That's different yeah. than the person who's, yes, I see the paintings now. They're kind of like these rock forms and there's pattern yeah. and line and just, 
anyways, I, those really yeah. speak to me. Yeah. Um, and then there's, you know, people who kind of explore more broadly like me. And I think that just reflects personalities. I mean, it's like, you know, I feel like this is my third career and it's not because I failed at being a potter or failed at being a freelance artist, although I did sort of fail at being a pre freelance artist. Um, it's that I have broad interests. It's kind of who I am. And I think, so my art reflects me. And I, I, I think it's, it's a personality type, people that can get kind of obsessed and with something and really good at it and then move on and get obsessed with something else and pretty yeah. good at it. You know, we have this capacity yeah. to, you know, really have this curiosity and need to learn something and get obsessive about stuff. I mean, I do it all over the place, not just in my work. Yes, um, you know, I do I've too. I've always had like, I'll be really interested in say family history for a while and I'll be digging into that. And then I'm like, oh, I'm done with that now and I'm not bothered anymore. I've lost interest or yeah, yeah it's similar. And I think it's a really good point to make for anyone watching because I, I tend to talk about it being good to keep moving and changing, but it isn't necessarily because it isn't if it's not you. So it's okay if who you are is to have one thing and really explore that and go deeper. And you make a really good point that I tend to brush over sometimes because I'm thinking of the way I like to do things. Um, but if you want to just become better and better and better at portraits, for example, and you want to spend your whole life just refining that, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But it's funny, isn't it, how I was talking to Gabriel Lipper, who's a representational painter from uh, the West Coast, and he was saying he always feels like if he's not going abstract, you know, he's not doing it right because he's representational and that's not quite as cool as abstract and then abstract what? people feel like oh if I'm not representational I'm not doing it right because I am not proving that I can paint something realistically so there's part of us which is always slightly thinking the way we do it isn't the right way or the way someone else is doing it is better and I think it's important to say that to beginners for them to know that it, that doesn't go away that that's there as well but you kind of get more it doesn't go away but you get more used to just ignoring it exactly. I just get used to ignoring it I just think okay well I'm not going to even think about that that's a really good point yeah I mean that's what I tell people about about your inner critic or like having a meltdown in your workshop it's like um having those negative kind of oh I'm not as good as thoughts is they're not going away they're just there they're just part of who we are um, and so, yeah, the skill is to recognize them and put them where they belong, like outside the studio. Yeah. And to, but not to deny them or pretend they're not there or think you're going to get over it. You're not. Yeah. You just kind well, of, it's like, um, for me now, it's like a quiet little, it just like in the background all the time that I'm not listening to. Mm -hmm. I just don't pay it any attention because I know it doesn't make any difference like you say if I start listening to it and then I try and do something good that'll just fail so It'll there's happen. no point in there's no point in listening either either it's rubbish what I'm doing or it's not and it, <laughs> there's nothing I can do about that so I might as well just keep doing it and see what happens there's yeah I think yeah I mean, I occasionally make a foray into representational painting. I did a bunch of florals last spring and summer because here was my thought process. I thought, OK, I got this abstract thing, like not like I'm a master at it, but my my sensitivity to the abstract aspects of painting um, is is pretty keen, you know, color and value and shape and size and all the kinds of subtle contrast and dramatic contrasts and arrangement of elements and all like all the stuff that is the abstract language can I investigate that like whatever aspect of that I'm interested in in the form of in the context of a representation representational painting and um, of course part of me is saying well then maybe I'd sell more work yeah and you know and then that voice is like right yeah sure <laughs> Right, Jamie, you're going to sell more work if you do it differently. But it kind of like the curiosity is about, well, maybe 
maybe I could get my curiosity fed in a different realm. So let me just see. And the answer is it doesn't, it didn't really feel like my work. I thought, let me just try it. So I did probably a dozen floral paintings and um, that was sort of interesting, but I, I sort of felt like I was copying people. You know, if I did a hundred of them, then I'd probably get somewhere with them. And I thought, well, let me just yeah. try. And then, and then I kind of lost interest or got interested in something else or whatever. But, you know, I sort of feel like anytime you go, go off in a new direction, I always think, okay, try a hundred of them. I never do a hundred, but I like that. The idea of like, I'm not going to make any judgments on this until I've done a hundred. I think that's such a good point because do you often hear, I know I do, people say, oh, I tried to do abstract. I did like three paintings. They didn't work out. So I must not be any good at it. And it's like, well, it takes a lot more than three to get good at something. Um, yeah. to find your own way with it. And it's the same with the florals. Like you say, it would have taken more. But if you're not yeah. interested enough to do more, then you've just got, you just say, okay, that's not. And that's yeah. Not and I might go back to them. I don't know. I mean, I have them and it was probably more than a dozen, probably a couple dozen. Um, and I do that a fair amount. Like I, when I see something or have an idea, I might go into it on, on paper. It might be 11 by 14, or it might be like the florals were 18 by 24, you know, not huge, but not tiny. Yeah. Um, and just like do a bunch and a bunch, like a dozen or two dozen is probably enough to either capture me and, you know, keep going or satisfy my curiosity for the moment and then you know maybe come back to them later maybe not yeah there's speaking about you mentioned that you wanted to explore the things that you have found out in abstract in representation and there's something on your website I just want to read for everybody um because this is similar to something I always talk about but I like the way you talk about it you said no matter what format or style my work takes, the pivot point of my visual explorations is sameness and difference. And can you just talk about that for people who maybe don't know that idea? What do you mean by that? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I tend to look at sort of composition through a lens of contrast and that I hear people quoting me on that saying, oh yeah, you have lots of contrast, but contrast really, I, I really specify it. Like contrast of value, contrast of color, contrast of size, of number, of um, proximity to the edge of the, of the piece or proximity to each other if it's two elements, um, contrast of edge and so forth. And then within that, there's like, degrees of contrast, subtle contrast, like really subtle contrast of any of those things through dramatic contrast. Yeah. And so that's a big continuum. And so when people say, oh, you have contrast in your paintings, well, yes, okay. <laughs> uh, contrast of yeah. what and to what yeah. degree. Yeah. And so I found that a really interesting lens to look through because often I think the default um, I see in students is, and myself, um, if you're not paying attention, like say to the scale of stuff, I know for me, my elements end up all kind of the same all size. Same size, yeah. 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 And um, if I'm looking at a painting, it's like, hmm, you know, hmm. Uh, and all the elements are the same size. Well, then that's like a handle, it's a handhold. Let me see if I can put some teeny tiny things in there or some great big things or, or space them out differently or whatever. Yeah. Um, and same with, with contrast of value. Uh, I do find that in general, if you're not paying attention, all the values are mid value, like within a small range. Yeah. And that's not to say that every painting needs some dramatic value contrast, but it's something to look at. And if you're doing, if all your values are really similar, then what's, where's the strength of the painting? Where, what, maybe it's a contrast of something else scale or yeah. type of element or whatever yeah um and so i'm really interested in in that like the degree of sameness and the degree of difference of 
all of those things. And so sometimes like I've got paintings that have, I've set these, well, you can see these stripes in the background. Yeah. And I've, I've set up a couple of new paintings here. This is sort of a new mode of working the <clears throat> off white on black. And then I'm gonna paint in colors and I'm, I don't know what colors and, and those are just a start. I may change the size and shape of things, but yeah. um, so those I'm using like elements that are the same size and they're the same element. I'm using all those bagels or donuts, right? Yeah. Or all the yeah. stripes. Yeah. So that's sameness. So then where's, you know, where, where's the difference? Same with those stripes. Like those stripes are relative, you know, pretty similar in size and they're like repetition. And those aren't, actually the two top ones are finished. The turquoise one is not finished. Um, so where's the difference? Where's the contrast? Where's the, like the edge there? <laughs> Yeah, the and the stripes I find so interesting. So this is something relatively new for you that you've been working on. And mm -hmm. um, it's that idea, isn't it? Just what you've just said, if everything, if this is the same element, it's a stripe. Now, what can I do to make it exciting to look at? And how can I vary things up? And some mm -hmm. of the paintings that I've seen online, um, just so interesting in terms of it's the color juxtapositions it's the shapes maybe there's little stripes and then bigger stripes are um mm -hmm. it's, it's finding all these different ways to make something that's seemingly simple interesting and mm -hmm. i can i was fascinated looking at the stripe paintings and with your permission i'll have a few running over oh sure yeah, yeah. so people can see them but i was fascinated you know just looking at why am I really enjoying this like why does this look really good oh it's because that color and this color and and mm -hmm. for everybody watching there's a video on Jane's website where she, uh, she talks about the stripes and that video is excellent because you're you're explaining all of this in the video and about your mm -hmm. explorations and there's one where you showed that you don't need very much bright color to make the painting feel bright that was fascinating because you can yeah. Because unlike, say, um, a more amorphic, amorphous abstract, like maybe some of mine, in the stripes, you can really see the quantity of bright colors. It's really yep. there. So mm -hmm. you can really see, oh, yeah, it's not very much orange. And yet look how vibrant it is and how it's running the painting. Mm -hmm. And so when you're, I've, I've kind of gone on about that a long time, but when you're working on these stripes, what what are the things that you're exploring and what have you discovered from doing it? I suppose I'm asking. Um, I'm still discovering. I feel like I'm in the sort of phase of trying to figure things out, but like those ones that you can see here, yeah. those are repetitive stripes. And, you know, not all my stripes are repetitive. A lot of them have like a lot of different, different colors. But so in that repetition, um, I'm looking at the subtle differences in the, the edges and in the color, like there's lots, the, that one that I'm pointing at now, sort of yeah. brown and off white, yeah. that's like 36 by 36 inches. So three feet by three feet, 90 centimeters that is. Um, so that gives you an idea of scale. So within each of those stripes, um, you know, there's a fair amount of depth and there's a lot of different colors. Yeah. Uh, and so part of what I'm looking at is how, like, I want, I want to look at it and say, oh yeah, stripes. And then look at it closer and, and see what's going on. So while I'm painting it, I'm, I'm interested in the colors and values and the texture and how much or how little of a color I can get away with. Um, so yeah. like in the pink one here, there's some bright green bits that you probably can't see. I'm wondering if I can bring my computer over here. Okay, here's some other stripes, right? Oh, here's an old painting that doesn't have any stripes. Um, Everybody's got studio envy while you're walking around. Yeah, well, they should. <laughs> it's an awesome studio. Okay, see that bit of bright green? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Gorgeous. there's there's stuff like that in in these textured paintings. Yeah. Oh, and all the yeah the different blues in that turquoisey one there. Yeah, and there's like red. some bright yeah. streaked red. Yeah, and so I'm more thinking 
what am I thinking? I'm not thinking much, but I'm getting sort of interested in in those little bits of color. Um, yeah. And you said something earlier, like, okay, now things are the same. And so what do I do to make it interesting to look at? And I just changed the language on that a little bit. What is compelling me? What am I interested in? Mm -hmm. um, because, or what is going to make it compelling for me to look at? Like I step back from it. Okay. Then go back in and, and it's a, it doesn't seem like a huge difference in language, but I think when I think, okay, what's it going to make, what's going to make it compelling to look at? I've got that other person that in mind, like somebody else looking at it. And I really don't want that. Yeah. I want that person. It's a hard thing to describe, but I find myself describing this to students a fair amount. Um, but as the artist, you got to play, you got to be the maker and the viewer. And so it's not like what's going to make people in general interested. It's what is compelling me. And so it's me, the viewer. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> No, yes, exactly. Because if you've got if you've got the audience in mind, then mm -hmm. you're instantly gonna start thinking, well, they're not gonna like that, or people aren't gonna understand this, or people and we just make up these people and they're always yeah. really hypercritical anyway, and they don't like anything that we're doing. So there's no point in thinking about them. <laughs> but if you kind of can't this is you know a hypothesis, but if you constantly chase what it is that's going to compel me like what compels me about that image okay maybe no one else likes it I mean I've made paintings that I post and no one like you know I don't get any response to them I think they're brilliant yeah. um but I feel <laughs> I feel like I have to chase what's compelling to me because that's the thing that I can I can tell like does it compel me doesn't it I can tell that I can't tell what's going to compel you or anybody else or a gallery owner or yeah. anything yeah. And, and the, the hypothesis is that then that will sort of drive my work in the direction of always being a reflection of me, um, which is kind of the best you can do. Like you can't, I can't, I can't be you, you know, like I can't, yeah. you can't, I don't know. I think that's so important a point that we should just stop and underline that because hmm. a lot of people when they're starting out or when they come back a lot of my uh, the people watching this they come back to art after a long time away or um we tend to think about what other people are doing looking at what's there'll be people watching this who want to go play with stripes now because you're doing stripes that's what yeah. happens we start thinking oh stripes looks in I could do some stripes I could try that but um, the problem is, if we are thinking like that, we are we are always away from ourselves. Where now I'm Jane thinking about what Jane's thinking about, and that's not what I'm thinking about. If if we follow what just what we're enjoying or interested in in that moment, as you say, we get more and more close to ourselves. And even now, I find myself editing myself sometimes oh no nobody will like that and then I have to stop and think no I, it doesn't matter because I do and I've just uh, as an example of that declared some things finished which to me feel like I love them nobody else will love them but I love them uh -huh. and it's got to be enough that I say I love them because as you say they're me and if nobody else loves them, I won't be happy if I go over them with stripes now to try and make them more like Jane. So <laughs> that will work. So I've got to keep them as me, but it's so hard when we're new to this to trust our mm -hmm. own instincts. Even when we're not new to it. I mean, it's it's a, I think it's a constant challenge because here's the other thing about that is that like we need to look at other people's work. We need to have those inspirations and we automatically have those influences and the inspiration can come from a lot of different places. And as artists, we like looking at other people's work and we need to. Yeah. Um, 
it's part of being in the business. I mean, not, not the, in the practice, I should say. I mean, it, I don't mean business as in you have to be a professional artist to want to look at other people's work. But so inevitably that influences us. And for me, the, the way I, I try to put that in, a, in its place is okay, I see so-and-so doing such and such a thing. And that intrigues me. So like I didn't invent stripes, like, right? I mean, it's a really common, long standing kind of format. Um, but if I see someone doing something, I think, oh, there's something in there. There's something in there that's really intriguing me. Let me try it. It's like borrowing the format and seeing what interests me about it. So if some of your viewers, say, okay, well, wow, Jane's doing those, those stripes in this kind of way. Let me, there's something in there I want to try. Or maybe let me try stripes and see if I can follow what's interesting me about stripes. Um, it's like following the format or, and then trying, okay, what is in it for, what's in it for you? Yes. Um, and Wait, so it's, it's not, I mean, to, and to me, the format is just one of the, parameters it's like okay yeah I'm doing stripes and then like in those textured stripes yes they're kind of alternating stripes whereas in you know some of these other stripes they're you know lots of different colors yeah. or stripes moving around or whatever yeah. um and that's just format so that's just like the structure of the piece it's not the I don't know it's not everything that's in the piece so yeah Yes, yeah, so take the, and I, what I often will try and do is I'll think, well, what is it that's really interesting me? So from what you're doing, what's really interesting me is the colour juxtapositions, which is ironic because my work seems to be going more and more monochrome at the moment, but the, mm -hmm. setting that aside, it interests me. And so I might think, oh yeah, that's the part of it that I want to play with. It's actually not the stripes, it's that it's the colors that's where I want to mm -hmm. go next I want to start playing with that what format could I use to do that in or how could I bring some of that into my own work and it, it's um it's something I, I have in one of the courses I teach that I stole from Austin Cleon and called it steal like an artist mm -hmm. but but instead of copying which is fine if you want to copy to learn that's fine too but mm -hmm. stealing like an artist is um taking what it is that you love that you're intrigued in and going off and playing with it by your, by yourself because then it will inevitably become you if you yep. do that if you do enough of them they become you and yeah I mean sometimes people say well I don't want to I don't know especially in my online classes sometimes people say well I don't want to look at the other people's posts the other students work before I do my own and I'm like, oh, look at everybody's. Just look at it. <laughs> like, you've got yeah. to do that. That's part of the learning. And um, so, you know, especially when you're taking a workshop, copying is totally fine. If, yeah. uh, and it's not just copying, get, like getting the ideas from the other students and me. I mean, sometimes in a workshop, there's a, an assignment that, you know, it doesn't, it's not going to jazz everybody. So my general rule of thumb is, you know, if, if you aren't particularly interested in this lesson in the workshop or this assignment, um, feel free to copy my format. Just here's the, here's the thing I want you to learn. And just by going through this process, you'll become more sensitive to whatever it is that we're teaching here. But just, you know, if you can't think of something on your own or it doesn't in, inspire you to come up with something on your own, just copy it. And then you go through the motions, you learn the the technique or the concept or whatever, and then move on. So I think um, the key thing, the key thing is the copying part is fine. The then putting it up for sale and saying that's not fine. <laughs> Cause, cause I've had people do that once in a while. And it's like, no, that not, not with my work actually, but with someone else's. And it was very obvious that that was a pure copy of something that's very unique to them. And it was put up for sale, or even with a similar kind of title to the way that she would title her work. And that yeah. is not okay. So it, I think it's fine to have a studio full of things you've copied, a sketchbooks full of things you've copied, as long as you don't pass it off as yours. Because when yeah. you 
to start doing that. As you said, I think it was when I talked to Brian Rutenberg, I think on the podcast, he mm -hmm. said, he said, copy, copy, copy. And what you get wrong is your style. Like, so what you can't force yourself to do just like someone else, that's you coming through. Um, hmm. and, I, and I think, as you said, if you did a hundred stripes paintings, you, well, you might not even make it to a hundred because you might find you're actually interested in something completely different. You might completely go off and not be making stripes anymore because that's not your thing. But mm -hmm. I'm very intrigued by something that's just popped in my head about these stripes and the pattern, the, the donuts as well. Is this a response to the pandemic and lockdowns and everything being the same all the time, do you think, or is that a coincidence? Uh, no, it's totally a, it's a response to the lockdown and it's not so much in my head, like, oh, this is how I'm going to express this. Yeah. <laughs> it's when, um, when the lockdown started in March of 2020, of course I had to cancel all my travel and I wanted, I wanted to lean into something that, that might seem sort of time consuming or even boring or repetitive. And I've, I've dipped into stripes a number of times in the last decade. Um, so it's always been kind of a format that attracts me. And of course there's like a million influences for, for stripes, yeah. both art wise and out in the world. Um, so there was something about that. Yeah, the repetitive, I felt like really kind of zeroing in on on something that was sort of soothing yeah. in a way. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe maybe that's part of it. Like the the structure of the stripes and the repetitiveness and predictability of some of it that is like the okay, I'm doing stripes. I know what I'm doing. There was something I I wanted to feel a little more safe or predictable or um, and of course they're not, but they have the illusion of, yeah. <laughs> of being like, okay, I know what I'm doing. Well, no, I don't. Um, so there's enough of like a, it's like specifying your parameters a little more narrowly, a little more narrowly. So, yeah. yeah. But I think it's going back to something you said earlier, you set parameters but you're also giving yourself permission to go off and do something else if you feel like doing something else. And I think mm -hmm. that's important for people who do say, as you said, oh, but I want to do all the things. I want to experiment with this, that, and the other is to let yourself sometimes do that, to choose mm -hmm. something to dive into, but then mm -hmm. let yourself. And also what you said about giving up on the florals after a while for now is mm -hmm. Um, I'd give yourself permission to go down the, the, the street and then find out it's a cul-de-sac and come back because we have to do that. We, we can't, we're not always, it's not going to go in a linear straight line, this art thing. It's not going to, we're not going to be producing work on a regular basis in that way. We've got to allow ourselves that experimentation. And that's why yeah. everything that you teach is about that. And I really enjoy that. I think it's, well, it's important to me, and I do hear from students, well, you know, I feel like I'm all over the map. I really want to focus in. And I'm like, eh. May, just make your practice so that you give yourself permission to play. And recently, you know, since I've been grappling with this idea of like, what is it about coherency and consistency that, that we limit ourselves with? And is that to do with being recognizable for the clientele of a gallery? Like the, there's the practical thing of, you know, I need to get this work out of my studio. Um, and so I need to be attractive to galleries. Um, and so like, do I have, does that mean I have to narrow down what I'm doing? I don't know. Yeah. Um, but I've decided for now that what I'm doing is like I'm doing works on canvas and panel that for now are these stripes and donuts and various things where I'm really exploring this repetitive 
uh, element and playing with the color and value and edges and so forth. And then on the other hand, I'm doing, I'm trying to think, do I have any of them? Um, I do, hang on one sec. I do this whole thing where I mess up things. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm starting often with, which is so okay. different from stripes. Like yeah. stripes are gone there. Yeah. Like what I'm trying to do is specifically, like here's one I just sort of started. I'm putting two elements or three in this case that are really different from each other in some way. These yeah. are two collage bits and then some scribbling. And I do a fair amount of this. And I decided that, okay, this is, this is the other thing that I do and I really, really like is working on, you know, smaller bits of paper. Those are 11 by 14 inches. Um, really jamming unlike elements together. And I think of it like putting together a dinner party of people that are, have different backgrounds and different you know, areas of interest, and you have no idea what that conversation is going to be like. Yeah. It's like, let me put this person with that person with that person and see what happens. So that's my attitude towards these things. And I do that a lot with um, gel plate printing, right. um, making not all over papers, but papers that have different parts to them. So prints, and then cutting those up and putting parts of those together and, and then painting and drawing on top and not, you know, not trying to bring it together into some cohesive whole, but really trying to bust it apart. Like, see, see what I can do here. That's going to make a kind of, that's going to interest me in its kind of contrasts of all kinds of things and juxtapositions of, of types of imagery. Like, I mean, this one isn't like a finished piece, but I'm looking at sameness and difference and this will keep going. I mean, they're all. Yeah. And then, and then something, what I find something in that kind of thing, which I generally do in sketchbooks, often in those concertina books, but yeah. something in that will trigger the next thing. Like, but you don't know when it's going to come or what it's going to be, but something in it will just mm -hmm. go, oh, what if I, because I think I saw you on a video a few months ago. Well, I don't know. It would have been time flies, doesn't it? Uh, but you were doing dots at that point and you were saying oh I just seem to be interested in dots I think you were just doing sketchbook thing I can't remember but now it's stripe so it was like repetitive pattern was then but now mm -hmm. it's come into stripe so the interests that we have are in our own are in our existing work and they mm -hmm. the next thing is waiting to be in there but the more we play and experiment the way you're doing the more we have a chance of finding out what that next thing's going to be. That's a great way of thinking of it. And I know people think of, um, I often, I often see people commenting on their own work this way. Oh, I work in a sketchbook to get ideas for larger works or like I do studies to prepare for larger works. And I never think of it that way. I think of studies. Yeah, exactly. Like it just doesn't knock work. something loose. I've, I've occasionally had something really nice composition in a sketchbook and thought, oh, I'll see if I can do that in a larger painting, but I can't because no. it was serendipity how it came about and it can't be repeated. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that, um, so, oh, just that process, you know, works for, for lots of artists. Like, let yeah. me do these studies to get to get my hand right at this thing and that thing and then do a larger painting. And there's much more sort of, planning and conceptual stuff. And I'm not saying that that's a bad process or that that doesn't yep. work. It doesn't work for me. And that's not how I work. That's not how I use studies. And so I think some people have the idea that, um, you know, like the old masters did these sketches and studies and, and lots of new masters do as well to prepare for a larger painting. And sometimes people think that if they don't use studies that way, that they're doing it wrong. And I, I think my studies are, are essential to me, yeah. to my practice, to knocking stuff loose, to get out of my primary mode, whatever that happens to be at the time. And um, whether I ever show them or not, they're part of the process and they might all end up in the trash or in the wood stove. Um, I generally scan them, scan them. 
I mean, most of them. And so I have digital images and, you know, so I get some value out of them and that way I show them and stuff. But um, for me, the main value is in the process yeah. of doing them, knocking something loose, giving myself that permission to really try to make the ugly work. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. got to make a lot of ugly work before you can make good work. Yeah. And so you might as well try to make it ugly and then then you've got no worries. It's like if you if you're not trying to make it ugly, you might get upset when it's ugly. But if you try and make it ugly, it's like, well, I I told myself it was going to look terrible. So it doesn't matter that it looks terrible. And actually, yeah. I want that one of my first YouTube videos, I was too scared to make YouTube videos for ages. But the one of the first ones I did was because somebody said, I just don't know how to paint loose. I just can't do it. And I said, well, this is how I'll show you. And I made a little video and it was really badly lit and nobody go look for it because it's terrible. But the point was, this is how you do it. You literally get a big brush loaded with paint and you splash it around. It's not hard. Like this, this is what you do. But at the end of that little video, I almost had a painting because it was so full of energy and looseness and I wasn't trying. Mm -hmm. it, took a, it took another session and it was done. Um, Whereas, like you said, I could go in and decide to make that painting and there's no way it would happen. Mm -hmm. So, so much comes out when we just let go of an intention. And I think that it's less true for representational painting because, of course, you have the intention to paint the vase of flowers or the person's face. And so that is some kind of a be the case. I, I don't have enough experience doing representational painting, although I did it couple of years over the course of a few years um I did figure drawing sessions I mean yeah. when as they were offered there was like you know eight weeks once a week of figure drawing and then another six week session later on in the year you know so it was intermittent um and the process there for me that was similar was like letting go of the need to make that drawing look like the figure and just really focus on what you're seeing. Yes. And of course, when you focus really on what you're seeing and getting that just right, getting those values and the proportion and all that right, it ends up looking like the figure. But if but I saw some people really that had like a style to their figure drawing. And so all their figures kind of looked similar. Just a few people. Um, most people were really just doing fabulous work at really looking and finding something unique and interesting. Um, and the drawings really, really showed that. So, yeah, I don't know if it's the same. Well, I think it is a bit, because I, I, when I used to do life drawing, I remember we'd always start with quick five minute poses or she'd do two minute, five minute, 10 minute, and then one long pose. And the invariably the five minute poses drawings I did were better than the long pose because mm -hmm. I didn't have time. Like you say, you've got to look, you've got to get something down quick. The line was more interesting. And I also remember our, ours was with a teacher and she ran it and she um, thought I was much too tight and too concerned with it looking good. So she fastened my pencil to a big long stick one day. She made me do it with the wrong hand. She, and they were so much Brilliant. better. They were yeah. so much better. So I think it is, this, it's not that, you don't want your painting to look like that vase of flowers, but you don't want it. You don't want the purpose of that studio session to be to finish a painting of that vase of flowers. You want the purpose to be to explore and look and try things. And, and that'll make a more interesting vase of flowers. I think. I think, I think that's right. Yeah. No, I had the same experience with figure drawing. I really liked the 30 second and one minute and five minute poses. And then the longer poses, they aren't as interesting because the model can't hold the interesting poses for very long. And I, I found myself doing multiple drawings on any one long pose, but yeah, those quick ones. I think that's why I stopped doing it. It's like, no, I would like to do an hour of quick one work. minute pose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there was some thought that you triggered there. Oh, the loosening up. Um, yeah, a lot of people say, well, I just wanna loosen up, I'm too tight. But the loosening up takes a ton of practice because there's so much art that looks like it just fell on the on the page, you know, it fell out on the canvas and it just was, you know, easy and spontaneous and the art expresses that.
but it's not easy and it's not spontaneous. You might do that spontaneous mark or brush stroke or something, but you've got to go in and edit that. The other thing is you got to do like 10,000 of them um, or 10,000 hours of them or whatever the, yeah. um, the mark is. But because a painting looks casual, it doesn't mean that the artist was just casual making it. Yeah, I think what you have to let go of is the need to make it look a certain way and, um, and really kind of go for it. But that doesn't mean that individual painting is gonna express that. It means maybe one out of your 20 is gonna look yeah. bad. Yeah, because um, I'd been do, I'd been experimenting with building up a really rich background, and then just making a few very gestural marks to to finish the painting, mm -hmm. and trying that, and that is really difficult. And sometimes the, when it works is when I really am not thinking, okay, this is a painting now. Because what happens is you built up the rich background, and then you go right got to get this right and then yeah. it's never going to feel like it needs to feel so I've noticed I'll I have to wait I'll be in a certain mood maybe once every two weeks when mm -hmm. I do the thing truly mm -hmm. spontaneously and it's all right and then the rest of the time if I try it it'll end up I'll have to send it all back and start again because it's not going to work um so it's so interesting that this idea it should be easy to be spontaneous right that's what, what could be easier but it's not because we're not actually spontaneous in almost any aspect of our lives we don't we don't just do whatever we want and whatever we feel and express all of that so how can we expect to be able to do that in our painting just without a lot of practice yeah I think you know when some people when my students say well I'm not very I'm not very comfortable with lines or mark making or something I say get a stack a hundred sheets of cheap drawing paper and a bunch of drawing tools and some time and just make marks on those pages and chuck them in the fire. Like they're not pieces, they're going away. They're, you're not even saving them for reference. Like really yeah. don't just, it's in the, in the practice, you know, no, you do your marks, you notice what your default is. You notice that, oh yeah, I always do it like this. And then you change it up, you expand on that. And so, and then try a different tool, try a different hand, try doing it without looking, try, you know, just play and push yourself. It's not just mindless mark making. It's really seeing what kinds of different marks you can make and, and not giving yourself any time to think between them, just do them and fill the hundred sheets. I mean, you might do like 10 sheets now and 10 sheets tomorrow, whatever, but like do all of them and then throw them away because they're not for reference. You're not going to try copying them. It's the practice, the, you know, getting your hands and eyes and working together to really explore that. And yeah. then, you know, and then it gets easier. Yeah. And then at some point, the ones that are supposed to come out in work will come out even though you, you, know, didn't better them, even though you didn't photograph them, even though you put them in the fire, it'll still, it will come out. I mean, the same with like color studies and things. It's, it's so, I find people really want to keep like a, a lot of stuff for reference and some, some stuff it's important to keep for reference, but even in color mixing, like, okay, make a color wheel, but like all those value studies and um, value gradations and mixing colors and and then notes about, okay, this, I've added, you know, two thirds this and one third yeah. that plus, it's like, <laughs> no, just do a lot of it and you'll get an, a really intuitive sense. And maybe making those kinds of, of charts and reference pieces as a beginner makes some sense. Um, but ultimately, uh, ultimately that becomes intuitive and spontaneous. Like, oh yeah, I need this green that's in my head. That's kind of like, the, oh yeah, grab this, grab that, grab that, you know, mix it. Mm. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's like color mixing and like any of them, any of the practices, they, you do a lot of them it is, and it's in the doing, not in the reference that, um, that gives you that uh, kind of foundation of, of, knowledge that feeds an intuitive painting yeah perfect I think that's a perfect place to to wrap this conversation up but before we do I want to ask where people can find you 
and your courses and your books and everything else that you've got? Where can people go to learn more? Uh, my main website is Jane Davies Studios. So there's two S's in the middle, Davies Studios. It's D-A-V-I-E-S. Um, and studios is plural. So janedaviesstudios.com. Um, and that'll have links to everything. Also, if you go to my Instagram, which is Jane Davies Art, I have in the profile there a link tree list of links, and that has all my contact stuff. So and Jane has an excellent book. Tell uh, just remind me what it's called. It explore is it exploring abstraction or it's um wrong. I'm looking abstract for painting. Book. Yeah, like where is it? Uh, abstract painting: the elements of visual language. I don't know what I've done with it. Yeah, it's excellent for anybody interested in abstract composition, particularly, you know, just in in what makes, I, I often get asked, well, how do I know if it's a good abstract painting or not a good abstract painting? And there's a lot goes into that, but it's, this book is quite slim, quite easy to read, lots of good examples, visual examples. So I really like that. Um, but for courses, for books also, uh, go to Jane's website and also go look at her YouTube channel to get lots of samples of how she teaches and and to see her work in practice because it's really um, I think it's really inspiring and also liberating for people to see the way that you work mm -hmm. well thanks yeah let me put um, one shout out and that is uh, this year with my newsletter every month I'm doing my newsletter every two weeks. Oh, that's a lot of sun in the window, isn't it? Um, and every once a month, I'm doing a little survey of questions. It's just two questions or three questions about your art practice. And uh, so you can get on my mailing list. And I always put a link to that on, on Facebook as well. So I really want to encourage people to, to take those survey questions because the, the point of it is, um, not only for me to learn more about what you want in workshops, but to share that information. So I kind of share the results on my blog. And so I've just done one round of the, the survey and then sharing the results on the blog. And then now I have the second survey question out. And it's just so we can learn about each other. And I'm just doing sort of a synopsis and um, so forth on, on the blog post. So that's something I'd love to have anybody participate in. And you don't have to sign up for my, my newsletter to get that, it's, it's on Facebook. So that's excellent. But if you wanna sign up for the newsletter, do better, <laughs> so. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jane. This has been a real pleasure. I'll put links to all that stuff. Uh, that's better. There you go. I'll put links to all that stuff in the post as well that go out with this video so that everyone can find it. So okay. um, thank you so much. Thank you, Louise. It's been a real, real pleasure. So I look forward to seeing more about what you're doing. Have a good day. You too. Take care.